Future Politics Panel. Well, the original troublesome twosome are here this morning. Jonathan Gibson, political commentator, and Reem Ibrahim, who is the communications officer at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Very good morning to the two. Good morning. morning. How are you both? Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> We're the OGs. We're back. You're, you're the OGs. <laughs> we are the OGs. Yeah. Um, we are the original groupies. The originals, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it when you ask someone how they are and they say fantastic. Yeah, well, that's good. Or marvellous. Yes. Marvellous. Yes. Wonderful. Well, I think we morning. need more of that. Right, let's start. Um, so, so I was saying this morning, and Rene and I were both saying this morning, actually, that there is really very little news around. You have to sort of dig quite deep to find it. This is quite interesting, though. Keir Starmer has pledged a return of the house building targets. Uh, he has declared war on the NIMBYs. Uh, they say, this is the Labour Party, says it will ramp up house building to ha ha help hardworking young Brits make their dream of home ownership a reality. Now, in uh, December 2022, Rishi Sunak ditched compulsory house building targets for local areas. And and this is after the Tory MPs, if you remember, actually threatened to rebel over this because uh, this was over the levelling up and regeneration bill. And, and I think Keir Starmer has a really important point here. Um, in my day, 100 million years ago, <laughs> um, it, was re it, was ex it was hard to get on the housing ladder, but we managed it because it was just about three times your salary and a deposit. It is literally impossible for young people like you, Jonathan, mm -hmm. to get on the housing ladder. No, it's incredibly difficult. And when I saw this story, I was delighted, I have to say, because I think, you know, nimbyism and the regulation on building houses is a, is a huge problem. And we fact is, you know, we've got people living longer, so they're staying in houses longer. We've got lots of young people who need to get on the housing market and are just completely not able to do so. So for me, this is a really, really good piece and a really, really good um, sign for young people that there is sort of a future to getting housed and getting on the property ladder. And Reem, are you going to embrace Keir Starmer for once? Well, this is probably the only policy position I've heard him actually come out with, which is fantastic. But look, I mean, we do not build enough homes in this country. I think mean, the average um, uh, house price in England is about 10 times the average salary at the moment, which is hugely extortionate. And we've seen the amount of rent uh, prices in London go up as well. So it is really difficult to be able to, for us to be able to afford our own home. We need to build more. And unfortunately, we've seen these Conservative MPs reject these house building because their residents don't like it. So cr I say crush the NIMBYs. Let's go for it. Well, he also goes on to say that he promises a package of reforms uh, to the planning system. So yes, build more houses, first of all, but also to give the first time buyers first dibs on houses in the area, which I think is quite an interesting policy, actually. Also stopping foreign buyers buying up ways of new housing developments but also and this is the other part that actually does make sense a comprehensive mortgage guarantee scheme for the mm. first time buyers because actually at the moment you may be able to pay the mortgage how do you get that deposit exactly. it's pretty much impossible mm. no it absolutely is and the fact is that i think the first time dibs but um, is a far more effective policy than some of the more demand size policies that the sunat government have tried to implement like this stamp duty which can simply just be passed on to consumers who are buying the houses so this really is an actual mechanism for young people that we can actually see a change start to happen hopefully rather than simply you know talking about demand side policies which in reality there's so much demand and it's not that side which we need change but, but it'll be interesting won't it how will this play do you think with his core supporters because some of them will be nimbys they they think yes it's great we want more houses i just don't want them near me well, that, well that's that's what the <laughs> definition of what a being a nimby well, is right. not in my backyard i mean you're absolutely right the core conservative base a lot of them tend to be very anti-house building and the reason being is because they don't want their own house prices to drop. But look, I mean, it is economics 101, I always say this, but if you if you increase the supply of something, the, the, the prices will go down. If you increase the supply of housing, prices will go down. Those exist, we know that the majority of Tory voters tend to be homeowners, the uh, Labour voters tend to not be, so there is that, that balance there. And, you know, we sort of thought about Thatcher as a property owning democracy, that sort of vision. We haven't got that, we won't get that until we build more you houses. Said, well, I will say that um, under the last Labour government, house building went down to its lowest levels ever so this is mm. a great idea mm. but whether or not he'll actually come through with it and I do worry I was thinking about this the other day if you're 50 and renting and you are going to come up to retirement what do you do once if you've just got a state pension I know. and you're renting what do you do once you lose your income and you've got a 1500 pound a month rent bill it's terrifying for people I think and young people are probably not even thinking that far in advance so I applaud it but I question whether so, or not so, they so the devil is in the detail and also as you 
remember under Thatcher and the right to buy your council house, which actually I think was a very good policy. If the money had gone back into house That's building. the point. What they did incorrectly was they didn't build any houses to replace the ones mm. they sold mm. off. And so actually owning your home is really important in terms of your self-worth. It's actually important in terms of having financial security. So I welcome this. I just don't know whether he can deliver this. Well, just, just, just to play devil's advocate here, I mean, I do think that, you know, when the government put in these targets, I, I, unless they're actually getting rid of some of these, the red tape and the regulations that are preventing a lot of this house building, unless the government do that, really just saying, I want this amount of houses to be built won't really do much. So, so shouldn't they actually say to these landowners who buy swathes of land and sit on it and actually don't develop it and wait for mm -hmm. the prices to go up and then release little bits, chunk by chunk, shouldn't there be some sort of legal, uh, legal sort of uh, direction to say you have to sell your land, you have or, to build. Or what they say to them is the moment they buy a bank of land, they have to pay an estimated appreciation tax up front. And if they had to pay that immediately before sitting on it, they would then build on that land. I would say build on the green belt. I mean, I think it's something like 1% of the green belt. Well, you I just agree. lose a lot, a lot of, of your votes. Well, I'm sure about it. I've, I've said this before, and a lot of people don't like it, but a lot of the green belt isn't green. A lot of it is just uh, the government sort of implementing this policy where they've sort of said this green belt cannot be built on. But if we build, I think it's just 1% of the green belt, the government could have uh, uh, actually achieved their housing. But you targets. see, there's, a, there's something that no one ever thinks about there's no infrastructure. So if mm. you do that there there aren't the schools there aren't the hospitals yes. there aren't the doctors mm, yes. you can't see anyone so there's no point just building houses in the middle of the green belt if no one can get there and you have no service no if you can develop the, the infrastructure that connects parts of those areas to you know sent metropolitan city hubs then that becomes an effective mechanism and that becomes a way of increasing productivity increasing the number of people that can work and has massive positive externalities so i actually do agree and i think you know that he has said that he doesn't want landowners to be able to sort of develop or not not develop these areas and just buy swathes of land for the product of earning more money mm. in the future. Mm. He's really obviously not read the 15-minute city plan, though, has he? Clearly he <laughs> hasn't. Or, or maybe he has. And <laughs> maybe he, he's, he's against it. And he's against it. Do we I like mean, I mean, it will be very interesting. I have to be careful. We're in Perda for the local elections. So, but I think it's, it's an interesting policy. The question is whether they can deliver it and implement it. It remains to be seen. Let's move on to talk about the SNP now, shall we? Because I, I, this, this is literally a car crash which mm. is evolving in front of us. And the fact is, it now transforms so the SNP obviously in serious trouble they've been searching for auditors for a long time and no one's touching it with a barge pole and now it, it transpires the UK elections watchdog may impose its own auditors mm. because basically if they don't get those accounts signed off they don't get a million pounds as a result of it 1.2 million they can't get 1.2 million exactly so uh, I mean you know uh, it just in terms of, of the the management do you think Hamza Youssef actually knew what he was getting into I I think he did and I think actually do you? I, I, I do think he did, and I think actually he's um, he sort of looked at the situation, assessed the situation, and, and and took the opportunity that he had. I think this is really good. I mean, I'm quite happy that Hamza Yusuf actually won because I think it means that the SNP will do quite badly as a result of the local elections and also uh, in, in the general election because obviously we know from 2019 the two big winners of that election were not only the Conservatives but the SNP did very well as well. Um, I think that when we're thinking about, I mean, this is really a car crash, isn't it? The entire uh, financing of the SNP and the way that they've been able to, I mean, it sort of breeds this corruption and this uh, an understanding of where this money is actually going. Well, exactly. Mm. Where is all this money, the 800000 What was that camper van? It went down as office and computer equipment. <laughs> Maybe they were working from home in it. Mm. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't put it past them. It's still not mysterious. computer equipment, is it? But, no. but also... But he says he didn't know that they'd lost their auditors six months before. No, he did say that. Absolutely well, right. the auditors won't say why they left, for example. No, so another that's problem. another really, really Sus. important point. The question is, actually, should they be forced to say why they was uh, they stepped down. I think the, when they, a lot of these auditors are claiming they're contributing to society by doing these sorts of things and making a positive impact. I think if you really wanted to make a positive impact and really wanted to increase transparency of political parties, which I think is in everyone's benefit, mm. you would say and you you know you should say why it says you stepped down. Whether there was you know charges of you know unfair corruption and unfair practices as is being suggested, or whether it's simply due to you know the reasons that the SNP are currently claiming. S yeah, so in. Interestingly, I've been reading, had the SNP been a private company, they would actually have been obliged to mm. lodge a formal reason as to why they stepped down as auditors. So mm. actually, isn't there a moral case to say 
actually they need to declare what they found out and why they left. Mm -hmm. I think absolutely. Even is. more so than a private company, I would argue. I mean, they're 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 a political party that are attempting to get into government, or and are in are in the SNP, are in the Scottish government, so in Holyrood. So I actually think that even more so than a private company, they have this moral obligation to let us know where this money went, why it was spent in the way that it was, because at the end of the day, a lot of that money that's raised in campaign finances comes from those donations and actually that are there to well supposedly do uh, the mm -hmm. greater good. Yeah. And where do you think this leaves the SNP? Well, I don't think that this is the start of the car crash. I think this is, you know, the continuing tumbling down the hill, to be honest, after the leadership election when they were just tearing like into each analogy. other and, that, you know, they were have really having a go at each other. I think they're in an incredibly weak position and unlike when they were Nicola Sturgeon was running the party four years ago in which they were actually quite strong, as Reem said, they did very well mm, in the, the last did. election. I think right now they're really facing a bit of a disaster. And, and so just in terms of Scotland, where will those voters go? I mean, clearly Labour thinks they, they stand a very good chance in Scotland. Mm. Do you think that actually they'll do well, will the Conservatives actually have a renaissance? I mean, I remember a time when the Conservatives were very strong in Scotland. They were. I, I actually do think that, I mean, I hate the culture wars, but I do think this trans issue will be that uh, that hill to die. I mean, Nicola Sturgeon was brought down by it. She couldn't define what a woman was and and actually was very OK with having a convicted rapist in a, a woman's prison. I mean, yeah. that is just absurd. I actually think those sorts of culture war issues might be the tipping point for the, for the Conservatives. Or, or is it the fact that actually drugs are out of control, that there's yeah. massive homelessness? They the, actually, NHS the NHS is on its knees. Aren't those yeah, the real I, issues? I, I, actually, mm. in some ways, I suppose the blinkers are off. People have suddenly gone actually, the, the record has been dire. And actually, mm. what the Conservatives had when they did really, really well in Scotland was Ruth Davidson. Yes. And she was special. She was one of those politicians that was actually very, very charismatic, mm. very believable, and they don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. Even Nicola Sturgeon was sort of a, a symbol of stability for Scotland. Mm. She was there a long time. She knew the party in and out. Too like, long. <laughs> she was, you know, 18 or, or whatever. Um, but they, yeah, they, they've really lost that. They've had it in fighting. You know, Scotland, the crime levels and the drug levels are, are a massive mm. problem there. I think yeah, the, the, the trans mm. stuff might have been a trigger, but I think, you know, the fact that was that Nicola didn't really have a really effective strategy for yeah. reaching Scottish independence, so there was that as well, which was really the backbone, I think, of why she See, had to lose. I think it's interesting, Reem. I think you're right that trans is very important to people because you know, most people actually think this is all a load of nonsense, but I don't think it was the downfall of Nicola. Do you think I think she knew what was coming. I think all of this was bubbling in the background. She had too doggedly stuck to that act. Mm. She had fought it against in, in Parliament, dismissed people, batted them away. There's no way that it would have just brought her down at the end. I think she knew this was bubbling and she Do had to you? go. Well, yeah. that's I mean, she denies silences. everything about that, but, you know, it remains to be seen. I mean, I think clearly this will all uh, come out in the wash. Let's just move on now and talk about something else, which is, and, and this is a very, very interesting story. The fact is uh, about the Home Office and the, the incompetence uh, in the Home Office that we're seeing, and I find this really interesting. Uh, Bob Neill, who's chairman of the House of Commons Justice Select Committee, said uh, this is our, in response to the illegal migration bill. It's gone through the House of Commons, it now goes to the House of Lords, and obviously there will be a lot of problems in the Lords with this, there'll be tons of amendments. What I found really interesting is Bob Neill has said the, the basically Home Office incompetence is to blame mm. for the mess we're in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think this is something which actually, ironically, people who are, you know, either very pro or very anti-immigration possibly could agree on that there is such a backlog, backlog right now in the asylum and the fact is the government have not been working there's so many people you know still waiting to be processed it's an incredibly long process and the rate at which it's going you can see is so so slow it's almost it's painfully slow so i think you know the incompetence on that behalf is not an issue of you know where well, should we have more immigrants should we not have more immigrants but it's just an issue of itself mm -hmm. and i think reform needs to take place that's very true i think this. i mean jonathan and i disagree a lot a lot and we disagree a lot on immigration <laughs> as well but one thing we are in agreement on is the fact that the Home Office is is just failing. I mean, the, the backlog at the moment with asylum applications is over 100,000. Mm. That is absurd. It's been like that for at least over a mm. year now. And immigration hasn't gone down. Now, we're talking about legal immigration here. The, these these small boats are unsafe. We know that we're not able to compete with those um, with those people because we haven't got those safe legal routes. I think the solution is, and I've said this before, that we need to implement safe and legal routes in order for these people to come to this country legally so we know who they are, we know what their criminal record 
records are. We know um, wh where they've come from. At the moment, they're coming here and they are being put up in taxpayer-funded mm -hmm. hotel rooms. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge amount. And a of huge cost, £8 million a day or thereabouts. 2.5 billion, 3 billion a year. And I don't think anyone wants that as well. I don't think whether you're pro or anti-immigration, nobody wants, you know, having to pay huge amounts of money because there's such a big government backlog because people are there for, you so know... So why so is there long. a backlog? Is it because they're actually being intransigent? Is it because they, they actually don't want to process these cases? I think it's because they're incredibly inefficient. There's a long process which is well, taking to process. <laughs> well, <laughs> well there, not, there is the... Is it not deeper than that, though? There is, is, there there is, not, the is there not an argument in the Home Office that the civil servants don't agree with government policy, I, therefore I they've so. almost down tools? I don't think so. I think the reason is because they're very... Obviously, both the Home Secretaries currently and the one previously, Priti Patel, pretty anti-immigration. So they want to, you know, they make it as, as difficult almost as possible for people to gain legal asylum here. So that means it's an incredibly long and slow process. And Priti it needs Patel to be is against down. this bill. She, Priti Patel thinks that this bill is too harsh. No, it's removing the idea of the bill. This is talking about the actual backlog and why there is such a big backlog. It's because it's such a difficult process that it takes so long for mm -hmm. a, an immigrant, for example, to gain legal status here. Mm, I know. It's really, really, you know... But, but where do you stand on the illegal migration bill itself? I mean, clearly, I think it is quite draconian. It clearly sets things out. I mean, it's red meat, isn't it, it as an election looms? Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of the bill, I've got to say. I do think it is too draconian. I actually think that when we're restricting immigration in such a way, I mean, these people are claiming to be asylum seekers. When, uh, we know from last year we saw the uh, the amount of Albanians that came over. We know that a lot of these people are not actually asylum seekers. They are economic they migrants. They say they're making progress but, with the Albanians. Mm. Well, we, hopefully we'll see that progress happen, but unfortunately we've not seen the numbers drop down, have we? The, the numbers haven't... Have, remain stable at the moment. I think the solution is is to compete with safe and legal routes. But we've got to remember, I mean, just talking about the amount of taxpayer money this actually costs us, a lot of these people don't, a lot of people that come here don't want to be reliant on the British taxpayer. They want to work. I say when they're having their applications processed, allow these individuals to work, give them a short-term visa so that they're able to actually work and pay for themselves. Yeah, can I just ask you one very quick thing? Time is very tight. But just, uh, I, I laughed to, to myself because we have the London mayoral election, the Conservative Party looking for uh, uh, someone who is a face. Uh, the article in The Telegraph this morning is uh, suggesting that Rob Rinder <laughs> and Karen Brady are considered as uh, Tory candidates for London Mayor. Is this the way that politics is going? You need celebrity status to actually get not. on? I really hope not, to be honest. I don't think, you know, being a celebrity qualifies you to be an excellent policy maker. I think it's a shame. I can understand, you know, it gives you a profile and it means people, you know, yo know you and so people benefit off of that. But I hope that's not the direction that politics takes because that's not your sort but, but Boris Johnson was a very successful mayor and actually it's because partly I think people saw him as a character and he kind of united left and right. Well that's the cult of personalities. I mean Boris Johnson was a character. I mean he still is but he it's that sort of lovable buffoon that people like right and it meant that he got away with so much because people just liked him as a character. Mm. I, I quite like Rob Rinder though I think he'd do quite well. <laughs> do you? Yeah well, I mean it's interesting Sean Bailey many people thought Sean was a very good candidate last Sean time. Sean didn't have any support from the party behind him he and didn't. had he have done I think he would have won that race but, actually. But if he's had a higher profile, if he'd been a celebrity, mm. would he have done better? Possibly. Depends what, what his personality, you know, radiated. Boris Johnson, his personality was incredibly likeable, and so it radiated support. Mm. And, you know, for better or for, for worse, I'd argue that he was a better mayor than Prime Minister, which is not I mean, just, just looking back at the last London mayor elections, we had two YouTubers join the race. I mean, we had Max Fosh and... What was Nicole Milano. Nicole Milano. Got, like, Nicole Milano the votes got the, the, the most votes. We've got more votes than any other independent got more candidate. more than Lawrence Fox. More than Lawrence Fox. More than, I think it was more than the Green Party as well. <laughs> and all of that. And can I just say, it meant yeah. huge amounts of young people actually turned out to vote just because they thought it was a meme. I don't know who those people are. No. <laughs> that's, because, that's because you're not young. Uh, thank you very much to John. Thank you. Gibson and Reem Ibrahim, thank you very much indeed uh, for thank coming you. in. Time for a break.